the other animals humans eat, use in science, hunt, trap, and exploit in a variety of other ways, have a life of their own that is of importance to them apart from their utility to us. They are not only in the world, they are aware of it and also of what happens to them. And what happens to them matters to them. Each has a life that fares experientially better or worse for the one whose life it is. Like us, they bring a unified psychological presence to the world. Like us, they are some bodies, not some things. In these fundamental ways, the non-human animals in labs and on farms, for example, are the same as human beings. And so it is that the ethics of our dealings with them and with one another must rest on some of the same fundamental moral principles. I'm not sure I even knew what a vegan was, actually, uh, before the time I became one. Uh, I became a vegetarian in 1978, I think it was, after I visited a slaughterhouse. And I stopped eating meat immediately. And then in 1982, I guess it was the fall of 1982, I was clerking for Justice Sandra Day O'Connor on the United States Supreme Court. And uh, Capitol Hill at that time was, um, was uh, uh, a rather uh, economically uh, depressed place. Uh, there were a lot of stray animals. Uh, many, many stray animals, uh, and, and, and they would often get hit by cars. It was, it was quite terrible. I remember uh, uh, once having an injured animal, and I called uh, the Washington Humane Society, and they sent over the disease control officer, who was a woman named Ingrid Newkirk. And um, uh, so she came to the court, and she picked up the injured dog, and we got into a discussion about... Um, she said to me that uh, I should consider becoming she, a vegetarian, and I said, well, I was. And, and uh, she, she asked me if that was for moral reasons, and I said, yes, indeed it was. And, um, and then uh, she told me that she and her friend, Alex Pacheco, had just founded a group called People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. And uh, that Friday night, she and Alex came over and had dinner at our house. At some point in the evening, Ingrid went to the... Uh, uh, refrigerator and she saw that I had milk in the refrigerator and cheese and 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 ice cream in the, re the freezer and she proceeded to throw it all in the garbage and I asked her why she was doing that and she explained to me that if I took this uh, seriously I, I needed to, to, to think about being a vegan I didn't even know what a vegan was I did I was not even aware at that time that there were people who uh, did not eat any animal products whatsoever and and so we had a discussion about it and the next day she brought me a book called Fettered Kingdoms, written by a guy named John Bryant, who was British. And it was about animal exploitation as a general matter and how, and he basically described uh, the use of animals and the various connections between meat and dairy and things like that. And it was about 70 or 80, it wasn't very long, it was about 70 or 80 pages. I read it, it was a Saturday, and I read the book. And I haven't eaten a dairy product um, since then. It became clear to me that veganism had to be uh, the moral baseline of anything that was going to call itself an animal rights movement. And uh, it became clear very quickly. Well, I was uh, 21 years old and I went, I borrowed money to go to a rock concert. I didn't have the money to go to it, um, but somebody knew that I really liked the band. And when I got to the concert, I noticed that on every seat there was a pamphlet. And the pamphlet talked about how animals would be used for the forthcoming holidays in various ways. For example, being give, given as gifts and then maybe not liked so much in a few months down the road when they were no longer a puppy. Um, eaten at the table, given as a fur, so their pelts being used and so forth. And it went through many, many, many ideas of how anim you, uh, human animals use other animals. And I thought, well, somebody came to a concert and with the idea of passing out all these pamphlets and putting them out on all these seats, how fascinating. So after I read the pamphlet, which was extremely educational, I thought, well, I'd find this person. And I wound up, I did, and I wound up outside. So I only heard the concert when people opened the door going in and out. And um, so it was, a, it was a big deal because, as I said, I did borrow money. Um, but I got the CDs since then, so I'm okay with this. And I talked to somebody who had uh, recently uh, changed his whole life 
and decided that he was going to live in a way that didn't exploit animals. And he was um, very interested in, in, in human rights as well as animal rights. That really came through. And uh, I decided, just by being educated uh, about the uses of animals, uh, that I would become an animal advocate. What Peter was doing was bringing exposés, whether it was the Taub case, uh, which involved uh, experiments with deafferentation, where the, the, the nerves of, of, uh, of primates were severed so that uh, Taub could study uh, certain things relating to stroke behaviors. That's where Pacheco got the job in the lab, and he, you know, he, worked, as, he worked in the lab, and he, he uh, engaged in surveillance and brought that to the authorities, and Taub was prosecuted. That's what the animal rights movement was in its inception, was um, people uh, bringing uh, information sometimes gotten in questionable ways or, or perhaps even gotten uh, criminally, um, but that, that this information was being brought to the public in an attempt to start discussion about the legitimacy of animal use. We had all these exposés. Okay, once the expose stopped and, and campaigns were, and, 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 and non-expose campaigns were going to have to be developed, what were they going to look like? The question became, in what ways were they going to have a positive program that was different from what had come before? Because what had come before was largely things like the Humane Society of the United States and the Animal Welfare Institute and, and those sorts of organizations, which were clearly clearly focused on the regulation of animal exploitation. I think that um, it was then that um, you started getting this distinction, this d debate between animal rights and animal welfare. The people who were the rights people were by and large vegans. They got it. They understood that if animals have real moral significance. If animals have rights, if they have a right not to be treated as our commodities, well, then that logically implies we can't eat them, we can't wear them. I mean, whatever else it implies, it, it implies you can't eat them, you can't wear them, you can't use them for, for various purposes. And so the rights people got that, by and large. The, the welfare people didn't. A number of people focus on the idea of feeling pain they talk about sentience in terms of whether an animal can suffer. Um, I, more and more, I'm avoiding that. And the reason is I think that people are so concerned about suffering that they tend to lead activism into a welfare position. And I'm talking about a standardized welfare position. There's true animal welfare. I'm talking about this custom sort of idea of making things better while they're still under our control. And the reason I'm saying this is this. It, our point as animal advocates is not about reducing pain, reducing suffering to the greatest extent so, the, so that maybe we can wipe out pain and suffering. That's, that shouldn't be the point. Nature bestowed pain on natural animals so that they would be able to thrive, to survive, to live on. So I think there's this obsession about pain that forgets the importance of life and their ability to live on their own terms. The animal welfare movement from its emergence in the 19th century was based on the notion that it was all right to use animals as long as we treated them properly. If you look at the distinction between use and treatment, the animal welfare position is use is okay if treatment is acceptable. The animal rights position is that use is not acceptable, however humane the treatment may be. The animal movement has now gone back explicitly to that position 
that animal use is acceptable as long as treatment, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, yes, it's acceptable to use animals as long as we treat them properly. And that is the classic 19th century animal welfare position. The only difference between the movement now and the movement in the 19th century is that this movement it claims to be more progressive in that it thinks that animals ought to have more protection than Jeremy Bentham thought in the 19th century, but that's, it's, it's really basically theoretically the same movement. And a lot of advocates say, well, we can't really change the world overnight, so we should at least try to make it a little bit better for them, because that's all we can really do. What they do is they, they beg the lawmakers to do something, help animals, do something, pass some law, get some, put somebody in jail, they abused an animal, and, and the idea is, will get authority to take care of the problem because we're so used to thinking that that's how things get worked out in our society. The other way of thinking that really undermines activism is the reliance on intimidation or on feeling that this is a battle, that the, the, the idea that this is a combat that we're in. And notice how that is also an, a form of authoritarian thinking. If we're going to go and we're going to force some company to change, notice that we're looking at the company rather than the people who buy from the company. Uh, we think we're going to go and, and get the company to change, do something different. That becomes sort of the vigilante aspect of the same of the welfare. What you don't see them asking for is a fundamental change in people's thinking. That these animals shouldn't be in there, that these animals shouldn't be commodified, that these animals shouldn't be used that other conscious beings are not a means to our end? You don't see that question asked. They think that it'll be easier to get the public listening or to, to attract members or to attract donors uh, if they point out that there are egregious things going on. In 1996, when I wrote Rain Without Thunder, I introduced this idea of new welfareism, that the difference between the old welfareists and the new welfareists was that the new welfareists believed that welfare regulation um, would and should get to uh, the abolition of exploitation in the long term. There is no empirical reason to believe that the regulation of animal exploitation will ever lead to its uh, abolition. There's no historical evidence for that. If anything, there is quite a bit of historical evidence that the more regulation we have, the more animal exploitation we have, because people end up feeling better about exploitation the more you regulate it because they think it's okay, it's humane, it's, it's acceptable, it's morally acceptable. I never thought thought in when I wrote Rain Without Thunder that uh, one day uh, PETA would be uh, having partnerships with large fast food chains and, and whatnot um, and promoting uh, humanely slaughtered this and nicely gassed that and things like that. I never thought that would happen. Many of the practices that these welfareists attack are pra practices that are already economically vulnerable. For example, the gestation crate with pigs, with sows. Um, animal, animal agriculture studies show that if you give, if you use an electronic, electronic sow feeding system as an alternative to these gestation crates, you increase sow productivity. You cut down on mortality. You cut down on disease. So a lot of these these campaigns that um, that that are that are the target of animal welfare people, uh, animal welfare groups like PETA, HSUS, etc., um, just about all of them, um, are are practices that are 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 economically vulnerable. Now, one might ask legitimately, well, wait a minute, if they're economically not viable, why does an industry shift without being told by the animal people to shift? Because if they're rational actors, wouldn't they, they do what was economically efficient? And the answer is, it's more complicated than that. When factory farming was developing, the people who were designing this, they weren't factoring in that we're not dealing with widgets, we're dealing with sentient beings that get stressed and get ill as a result of that stress. So people weren't really thinking about, you know, they were thinking about concentration, you know, concentrating commodities and, and increasing profits. They weren't thinking about, and they weren't factoring in what the costs were going to be of that, of that intense concentration. And what's coming out now is, you know, is, is indications that certain aspects of factory farming are very economically inefficient. But it takes time for that information to get out, for that information to become internalized within the industry, and for capital costs to be incurred to change those practices. Industries like the meat industry or, or biomedical research for that matter 
um, will resist any sort of, of uh, regulation, even if they don't think it's particularly harmful, because they always need to impose opportunity costs on opponents or adversaries, because they want to make sure that everybody understands if you come after us, if you want us to change something, it's gonna, we're going to exact our pound of flesh from you. I remember having a conversation with some vivisectors at the University of Pennsylvania where I was then teaching, and I said, you know, why are you guys opposing the, animal, the 1985 amendments to the Animal Welfare Act. They're not going to hurt you. If anything, they're going to help you. And they said, yeah, we know it's going to, you know, but we've got to oppose it because if we don't oppose it, if we're not seen to oppose it, um, then you might come after us on something we really don't like. What's happened is that the animal movement has become, you know, there's this bizarre partnership between animal industries and animal organizations where animal organizations are going after these animal, you know, after industries for largely, you know, uh, minor changes. They go through this dance, they yell and scream at each other, and then there's some accommodation, which doesn't require that industry do very much. The animal people then declare victory and send around 80,000 million pieces of direct mail and ask, you know, tell people, you know, you can help change the world, just write us your check. And, and they make lots of money. I was saying in the 1980s, what we ought to be doing is coming up with creative, nonviolent ways of educating people about veganism so that we can shift the paradigm away from the property status of animals, because that was also clear to me as a lawyer, as a law professor, it was clear to me that animals are economic commodities as long as they're, as long, you know, I mean, as long as we have this relationship of property to property owners, as long as animals were economic commodities, every time you try to protect the animal interests, you were paying money. What that's going to do is it's going to severely limit the sort of protection that we accord animals. And that's why animal welfare doesn't work because it's bas it basically, we can't afford to protect animal interests, protect, particularly in the world that we live in now with the fact that we have all of these trade barriers down, we have this quote free trade situation. It's never going to work. If we really want to change the world, it's got, we've got to focus on veganism. And so I was saying this for fairly, fairly early on, and, um, and, and the, I, I was encountering resistance. I mean, I, I encountered resistance fairly early on. Part of it was many of the people involved in these organizations, particularly the, the, the groups like HSUS and Animal Welfare Institute and Fund, uh, uh, these were organizations where many of the people involved with them weren't vegan. And also, they went to a donor base for contributions of people who weren't vegans, and they didn't want to upset them. They didn't want to alienate them. So people wanted safe campaigns. They didn't really ask anybody to do anything other than give money to support the campaign. They didn't require that they change, you know, they didn't, they didn't require any sorts of, of personal changes. And so I encountered that right away, and it became clear to me that the economics of these organizations was inconsistent with what I thought ought to be the case, which was basically promoting veganism. Um, who is it who should have rights, who, whose interests should be respected, anyone who has them. Generally, the way people look at this is if the animal can get away, 
there's some sort of painful stimulus, for example, and you see the animal swim away, run away, fly away, then that animal knows, uh, you know, I'm conscious of my own being, I need to get away. And uh, any animal who's conscious, that's what I look at. And it, of course, uh, if the animal is unconscious but be, could become conscious, I still mean you know, any group of animals who has con that have consciousness, uh, I think, should have their interests respected. You decide you're going to become a vegetarian, you sort of push out animal products from your life. You, it's sort of a negative decision. You stop eating this, then you stop eating this, and then you stop eating that. Uh, I think it's important to look at this again from an, the issue of domination, all right? If you look at vegetarianism as the relinquishing of your place on the top of the heap, to stop dominating other animals, then you're going to look at this differently. It's not what you're going to stop eating today, next month, next year. It's how, am I, how quickly can I remove the products of exploitation from my life, all of them. So vegetarianism is a diet. It's a question about what I'm going to eat and what I'm not going to eat. Veganism is a way of thinking. It's a way of respecting other beings, humans and non-humans alike. It's a revolutionary idea, and it was started by a person who believed that this would change civilization radically, but that it would create the first culture that really had a claim to calling itself a civilization. The one thing that you can do right now is to decide to apply the principle of abolition in your own life, the principle of nonviolence in your own life, and stop putting them in your mouth three times a day. And the thing that we, that all of us, the thing that each of us, you, me, everybody else has the power to do right now is to stop using them. Stop treating them as commodities. That is the single most important thing that we can do. Indeed, my view is whatever else you're doing, if you're not a vegan, I don't understand what you're doing. I don't understand why you care. If you're eating them, if you're wearing them, what do you care? Why, why do you care?